about this month. This month is a focus on, on, on missions, about what we do every year when we take and we renew uh, our commitment in prayer and in financial giving, too, to be a part of the many ministries that are connected to Abundant Life. Um, as I look at this broad spectrum of missionaries, we have them in Botswana, we've got them in the Philippines, we've got them um, secretly teaching as teachers in China, we've got them going to supporting mission orphans, which in two weeks John Shane will be here um, and, and be able to share with you what God is doing in um, the Ukraine orphanages and in uh, Sri Lanka and India powerful ministry. How many were here years ago when he brought the Russian Orphan Choir? Oh, talk about rip your heart out. That was an experience, and it was one of the most powerful services. Um, we left with an incredible sense in our mouth. He's, he tells stories about showing up to one orphanage, and the whole orphanage had one single roller skate as a toy. So every year he goes, it comes to us, we, we take the time to stuff his duffel bag with little, uh, you know, little um, fluffy toys he takes with him. And anyway, I, I'm really excited about this month. But this morning I, I was, you know, praying, and we've been gone on vacation. I mean, we've been skydiving. Man, we've been, uh, we've been doing all kinds of stuff. Well, in a wind tunnel skydiving. And anyway, it was still fun. And uh, it was good to be gone last week, although we got to, we got to watch online, uh, which was an interesting thing. I've never watched our church online being away like that in its entirety. I got to see the whole service. That was really interesting. Tammy did a great job. And uh, <clears throat> um, the band and, and Shane and Frank was here playing. And we had uh, quite a crew, so it was fun to watch online. And it was fun to be away and, and just be a little bit lazy for a while. And we really enjoyed that. As I began thinking about this month, and, and I was impressed by the Lord, really, that there's a first part of mission, the first step of missions, and really being effective in that area is becoming missional ourselves. You know, when you have a mission, you get a mission, you get the plan, and then everybody kind of goes in order as a team to move forward to accomplish the task, to win the victory, and to do the thing. And it's, it's just a fact that if we want to personally do, if we want to see that happen and, and really be effective, that we truly personally need to experience God. There's got to be a real brass tax to our relationship with Him. And, and this relationship with God is about relationship. It's about really having someone to communicate with, just like kids growing up to know the love and instruction of their parents. Our Heavenly Father has the same feelings in, in, in a greater measure toward us or the new, with this new birth that we get in our lives and a long for a meaningful relationship. And you know what relationships in your life, there's some that are more important than others. I mean, you think about the relationship that you have with your spouse or your wife and the person that you have at the checkout counter at Walmart, that's a pretty different dynamic in relationship. One is very intimate and close and a lot of communication going on. The other one is, do you want change? How do you want your change? You know, um, the, the relationship that I have with, with my kids is different than, than any relationship that I might have with some strange person out there uh, that I just meet uh, off the street just for a moment. Uh, but God desires to have meaningful relationships with us, as you know. And, and we know from his word that God so loved that he gave. And, and a couple other scriptures I just want to point out that really echo God's great desire for this relationship. Hebrews 2.10 says, God is the one who made all things, and all things for his glory. He wanted to have many children to share his glory. I like that. He wanted to have many children to share his glory. 1 Thessalonians 5.10 he died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, we may live together with him. That sounds like somebody who wants to be with me. Somebody that wants to be with you and I and, and hang out with us and, and be our father. Second Peter 1.3 says, Everything that goes into a life of pleasing God <clears throat> has been miraculously given to us by getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us. Quite a statement that God has just miraculously come into this world and, and given his life for us and shown us his great love and created us for that very purpose. You know, it really begins in all relationships with repentance and with God, a sorriness for our sin. 
You see, repentance isn't the only thing that God requires us in order to be free from our sin and to be saved, but it is the first step in a course in relationship. And basically, it's kind of the form of, of repentance is key for every relationship. Humility is part of a relationship. It's also part of repentance, where we become less than the person, that we could serve them, that they, they might know that we have concern for them. That's very much like repentance. We, we practice on people all the time by respecting them enough to speak with them, to, to respect them as a person, to humble ourselves, to gain their respect. And, and to look at all of these things like this is to really signify the same attitude of repentance that we need to have toward God, except in a much greater measure. I want to say something this morning, and this, is a, this message this morning is an acrostic of four letters, the word SEEK, S-E-E-K. And the first one really has a lot to do with this statement because repentance is key because there is no other first step in really getting to know God. How many know that? When we come into salvation, we say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. I recognize that you are Savior. And then all of a sudden, God begins to work in our life in powerful ways, and we have such joy in knowing Him as we walk with Him, just like I do with my children. I have a joy in seeing their successes and achievements and the, the things, and even their struggles. I, I have a certain amount of, of, of ability as a father to speak into their life and to encourage them, and, and they encourage me just by their joyful exuberance. I'm like, I don't even know how in the world that some things happen, I just tell you. <clears throat> if I could say, it would be amazing. You know, as a kid, I grew up in this church environment. I got to say I'm a church brat. So as I grew up in this environment, I kind of grew up under this, this hellfire brimstone type preaching. Anybody ever been exposed to that kind of stuff? Okay, well, I kind of grew up in that, and so there was a lot of things about me that I learned that were not good, and a lot of things that were. The traditional thing, you know, all the women had to have hair, buns in their hair, men had to wear pity loafers, walk just right, talk with just right, do all these things just right. If you dress a certain way, you might not be able to even come in the church, uh, which really never happened under my dad's ministry. But, um, but one thing that I did learn that was good under that kind of preaching was the ability to repent. Repentance in the altar was something I became familiar with at a very young age. We had what was called altar calls um, often, and on Sunday nights was the big service, you know, for altar calls. I mean, how many remember that? We'd go to the church service Sunday night, and we'd lay there and cry out to God over our, uh, whatever it was and, and lean on Him. <clears throat> I think that when I went off to Bible school, uh, something happened, and I got that educated part of me going, and it it worked the repentance right out of me because now I knew everything, of course. <clears throat> I came back to church and basically told them they were doing the worship wrong and told them they weren't preaching right and we can't sing this anymore because it's bad doctrine and, and we can't behave. Because, and you know, the styles have changed too. It used to be, Maranatha, Jesus is coming again. Now it's, do, 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 do. Maranatha! Yeah. Uh, um, which I like better, but... One thing I did was uh, my extreme arrogance of knowing that I could do everything better than everyone else because I was a young buck and I had, you know, I had some talents here and there and, and if there was you know, something that had to be done, I could just do it and I was called upon to be in the front all the time and, and that, you know, that has a tendency to take hold and after a while you begin to recognize that you really do know everything more than everybody else and the dangerous part of it was that I began to question sometimes make the older ones in my church feel as though uh, they were less than me. And what a ridiculous, dumb skull kid. And this attitude was a difficult thing to struggle with in my life because um, for a large part of it, my dad wasn't around to knock me down. So I'm a pretty big guy and very few people have tried. So um, it, it really took a moving of God's Holy Spirit to remind me of his grace. That his grace doesn't care how good I am or how much doctrine I know or how well I can play the piano and sing. What matters more is that I have the ability to say, God, I so fall short of what you're calling me to be. Now, from the very beginning of our little talk here today, I don't want you to confuse an issue. The first issue is, I don't want you to think because you're not striving to do all of these things that you're not saved. Because the thing of it is, the Bible tells us that whoever calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. That's salvation. This today is about those who want to mature and grow in their faith. If you are someone who wants to grow in the Lord and become more like Jesus, this is for you. 
And so I want to encourage you with that today. And, and because I came back as a young guy with my new skeptics talent and, and had all these things to confront people about different stuff, and none of it really mattered. And one of the greatest tragedies I think we have missing in our generation is the ability to repent. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 is our springboard text. That was all the setup. That took me 10 minutes. Can you believe that? 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. I'm going to read from the NIV, but I also want to put the New King James up here in just a moment. It says, Godly sorrow brings repentance. Godly sorrow brings repentance. That leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you? What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. Look at what the King James says and how much more colorful words the New King James. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all these things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. In other words, he says, when you had godly sorrow and you understood what God required and you were sorry for not meeting that standard and you were in that repentance mode, you were blessed. But you, when you were over here and you're just sorry that you got caught in some sin or caught in for something, just for that moment, that doesn't help you at all. You know, the first letter here to our acrostic is seek of seek, S-E-E-K, is the word sorrow. The scripture here uses the word sorrow, and sorrow because our sin has separated us from God has condemned us. We understand this at salvation. If you don't know the Lord, you don't have a relationship with God, I want you to know something very real, and I'm not afraid to say it, that your sin will lead you to hell. If you have not asked Christ to come and clear you from your sin and forgive you for your wrongdoing, that we're all sinners. And we need His grace and salvation. So you need to make that decision today, and I encourage you to do that. We all have. We've all had to become humble and say, God, forgive me. I'm not here to judge you. In fact, I can't. Jesus said He didn't even come to judge. He came. He didn't come to the world, but He came to, to uh, show His word and communicate with us His great salvation. He came to save the world. I was reminded of this sorrow word. When I was talking to someone recently, a week, two weeks ago, on a job. And I went to the job, and a guy that has been working on the job for me has showed up, and he was there, and we were talking, and I said, let me ask you a few questions. As he started talking about his church, the Mormon church, I said, let me ask you a question then about salvation. He said, I just like what they say. That's why I said, do you go? I said, no, but he said, I like what they say. So I said, let me, let me ask you this. Are you a good person? You guys know where I'm going with this, right? He says, well, yeah, I'm a good person. Well, let me tell you that the Bible says, this is what the Bible says. I'm not trying to, you know, color it in any way. But the Bible says if you've committed one sin against God, you've committed them all. And so let's just take, for example, the Ten Commandments. He kind of went like that. And I said, well, have you ever lied? Well, yeah, uh, well, you've lied. Have you ever committed adultery? Well, no. I said, well, you've never looked at a woman and lusted after her. The Bible says, Jesus says that you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Well, yeah, of course I have. I said, you know, have, have you ever done this and that and went down the list? And of course, he'd done them all, like we all have. And I said, did you know that the Bible says that because of your record, because you've broken God's commands, that you are destined to hell? He said, but I'm a good person. I said, I'm just, I'm not. He said, well, that's your interpretation of the Bible. How many have heard that? I said, well, this is what it says right here in Scripture. This is what it says, that we're condemned by our sin. And that that book, those things that God put in order, is what we have to live up to the standard to. You say, well, that's pretty hopeless. That must, be a, must kind of be a drudgy church you attend. I mean, it's, I said, well, you know, the, there is good news, though. Oh, oh, well, finally, he says. I said, you know, Jesus came to fulfill all the requirements of the law on your behalf. So that if you come to know him as Savior, ask him to forgive your sin and begin following him, that he will take that sin away, and you are before God spotless. He said, well, that's good news. <laughs> that's the good news. 
It begins with repentance, though. And unlike, friends, if you're a follower of Christ, there's people that actually read the Bible. And we don't let movies or pop culture define spiritual principles to us. We investigate them ourselves, right? And Christians, we do the same thing when it comes to sin oftentimes. So repentance and what God actually says in His Word. And friends, it is the job and the joy of a maturing, anointed Christian to have godly sorrow. Until that we're able to look into God's word and realize that you and I in every way are living to please him and that you, you until we have achieved everything, that you and I have the job uh, and joy of repentance. Until we've transcended from being human beings and we are out of this flesh, we have the joy and the job of repentance. What we think when we hear repentance or sorrow is often interpreted as sad and pathetic way to live. How can you live that way? But friends, it's actually quite joyful. Repentance and godly sorrow produces such joy. And that's the distinction Paul makes here. He says godly sorrow makes joy. Worldly sorrow, nothing. You're just going to pack up the bags you had. You're going to walk right back out with them. No relief. And worldly sorrow is depressed because it has no answers. Worldly sorrow is a, is a mournful thing with no relief, no outlet. Uh, anxiety, fear jacked up all on our own because we're not looking to the source of the one who can take those sorrows, take those burdens. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, um, powerful communicator, so prolific were his sermons in the day that they used the paper from the printed ones to wrap butter in, and people would open them at their dining room table and become Jesus followers. St Charles Spurgeon once wrote, The same sud that melts the wax hardens the clay, and the same gospel that melts some persons to repentance hardens others in their sin. And this is the truth any time we communicate God's word of repentance. That there are some that go, oh, I don't need God if it's a God with a big stick like that. And we, that's how we view him. Then I don't want to repent to any God like that who requires me to do all this stuff. And, and then there's this other group of people that look at that and say, God, wow, you really have in mind for me a successful best life. So I want to turn to you with my life. And so there's a big difference between someone with godly sorrow and understands the job and joy of repentance. And God is the one we've got to direct our sorrow toward. And we have a lot of sorrows. I mean, if we think about repentance, how many maturing Christians, how many people that are maturing Christians would say that we know the art of repentance? Well, maybe it's a few, maybe it's a lot. But whatever it is, we really have a lot to repent for. As we walk through life and you look at God's word, doesn't it lead you to repentance? Let's just start with the Ten Commandments. Number one, in Larry's lingo, it goes this way. Repentance acknowledges shortcomings of our values. Did I say that already? God's word, the second one. Did I skip that? Oh, yeah. No, this is it. Look, this is it. <laughs> this is the Ten Commandments in Larry's lingo. Do you protect your life from other gods? Do you treasure your time with your favorite toys more than enjoying the benefits of repentance? Do you take time to rest like God says to rest? Do you honor the authorities God put in your life, your father and mother? Do you wish harm to someone because you're angry with them? Jesus says, you just murdered. The next one. That's it. Oh, do you have more fulfillment in pornography than in purity or in your spouse? There's more. Do you steal time from your employer or money from your taxes? Do you lie about people to make yourself look better? Do you want others to have do you want what others have more than you want to please to plead with God for more grace? Now, this is quite a list and it is the 10 commandments just kind of put and adapted to the things that we live with every day in our modern culture. Now, if we take a look at that, we say, Pastor, that right there has plenty of stuff for me to begin seeking God for. And friend, the, the parallel of all this is, is that God is asking us and talking about his commands and his standard. And when we look at his standard this way, we go, my goodness, I'm lost. You know, in our class during Connections Hour, we're going through uh, the more than 50, really, but 49 character qualities that God says Christians should have in their life. Look at this list. Oh, my goodness. 
I'm supposed to be alert, not unaware. I'm supposed to be attentive, not unconcerned, available, not self-centered, bold, not fearful, cautious, not rash, compassionate, not indifferent, contentment, for not covetous, uh, creative, not underachieving. Uh, I'm supposed to be, have discretion in simple, instead of simple-mindedness. I'm supposed to have hospitality rather than loneliness or humility rather than pride. I'm supposed to have orderliness, not or disorganization or punctuality, not being tardy and late. Uh, I'm supposed to be sensitive and not callous. I'm supposed to be thrifty and not extravagant. I'm supposed to be, have virtue, not impurity. I'm supposed to have wisdom and not a natural inclination. But that's a list. Oh, my lands. Look at that. This makes me feel about this big. I look at that list and I'm going, you're kidding, right? Well, when I think about it and I look at the list and I think about the other commands of God in Scripture, I begin to realize, wow, my character needs to be saved. You see, this is the maturity part of a Christian. We all come to Christ and say, yeah, Jesus, forgive me, save me, and come into our life. Then all of a sudden, God asks us to grow in this thing called character. He wants us to be uh, to have a gentle persuasiveness rather than being contentious. He wants us to, to respect those who are older rather than flip our nose at them. He wants us to live this way. Now, all of a sudden, doesn't that make you just want to go, God, have mercy on me? Well, you know what? It should. Because it used to be that back in the olden days, maybe 20 years ago, <laughs> that we would feel the pressure of God's requirement as a maturing Christian. Mind you, this is not to be saved. <coughs> but knowing what the lover of our soul, the designer of the universe, the creator of our life has, has put within us, in our grasp, his word, to look into his word and go, oh, God, have mercy on me. Now, if you take this list and say, I'm going to do this this week, <laughs> forget about it. But if you look at that list and you find your worst thing and you explore it in the scripture and you say, God, have mercy on me. See, that's where we cross over to repentance. The art of repentance is saying, God, you have a standard that I recognize would bring you more pleasure from my life. And I want to do that. I want to live that way. i got to tell you, I look at the list, and, and uh, it says difference versus rudeness. <sighs> Have you ever been in rush hour traffic? That is just, this is where worship, a lifestyle of worship, comes into play. Where we turn into a strong but gentle person of God. Someone who is resolute in the character principles of God's word, but we have deference. In other words, we're going to accept everyone else just like they are, but we're going to live to the standard God has called us to. If you have a struggle with being intolerant, if you have a struggle, and I'm not talking about the intolerance as defined in our world today, boy, it's a lot different according to God's word. Justice, intolerance versus... I mean, justice is what God requires. We, we have crafted in our country laws that, that we think are right because everybody's voted for them. When God doesn't call for the vote, he calls for his justice. See, just the Ten Commandments and this, these 49 things listed here are enough to make a shake. It should be enough to make a shake in our boots if we want to be a maturing Christian. If we want to be good at following Jesus, we're going to be good at doing these things. Matthew 4.17 from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. The word repent comes up all the time in the New Testament and in the Old. Repentance really is the ability to say, yeah, I don't do that very well, and we recognize the call of God to raise the standard in our life. This is not the message that maybe we're used to hearing in an American church anyway, but, you know, preaching repentance is dangerous. John the Baptist's head was chopped off for preaching repentance. Jesus was stripped, beaten naked, beyond recognition, nailed to a wooden cross for preaching repentance. The Bible recognizes those who always just and only preach peace and, and tolerance and love and acceptance. In fact, it talks about the false prophets, talks about them with terms like uh, whoredom or prostituting their gift or describing false prophets as those who do it only for profit. The false prophets in this generation will tell us the same thing, and that we are forever to be tolerant. But the difference between tolerance is deference that God calls for. That we accept people for where they are in the Lord, but we absolutely stand in the word of God. 
And we say, this is what is true and what is right. You see, sin should make us feel bad. Sin should make us feel bad again. <coughs> we shouldn't be able to sit there underneath the knowledge that we have this sin that we have not repented for. In fact, Charles um, uh, Finney said, if you know a person that's sitting and they're sitting in your congregation, preach at them till they squirm. Drag them to the altar and make them repent. <laughs> I'm not going to do that today. But hopefully, hopefully the Holy Spirit would say to you and say to me as well, I'm in your boat, friend. I'm human. I'm flesh and blood. That we would say, God, I am so sorry. And that it would come to the point where we would say to the Lord, Lord, I am sorry for being late to this appointment because I am disrespecting the others that are here on time. I wonder what kind of things, if we began to work maybe on punctuality, this one of the smallest things in our life, what kind of successes it would open for us in the future. If we're a really messy person, if we would get a hold of this idea of organization and orderliness, character qualities that God has in his word, we would have so much more opportunities in life. Hmm, it kind of makes me wonder. If God's called us to them, he must have a reason. God is not tolerant of our sin, but he is patient with us. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Friends, God is not held off lighting the match of eternal flame and fire because he finds our sins tolerable, but rather because he is patient with us. And he has given us every opportunity for repentance. To come closer to that's what repentance is coming closer in relationship to God and the message of the false prophets of our generation are saying that God is not exclusive but inclusive and and approving of all lifestyles and all sins sexual sin and debauchery and and all of these things and God is it he but he, the problem is he is inclusive he is he calls all people to repent of their sins the entirety of the Christian life is repentance. The experience of the gospel is repentance. And, and any theology that does not call people to repent really, quite frankly, is heresy. The scripture tells us that godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation not to be regretted. Something that when we have it as a practice in our life. You know what's so powerful about it is that it produces a desire, a lot of desires in our life. The E, the next one. First one, sorrow. The next one, e, eager to be free. You know, it's up to all of us, every believer, to cultivate the desire for the peace that God promises in this life. There, there is a life that God has for his people, and it's a life in the comfort and peace of the Holy Spirit, something beyond anything this world can give. And that life comes through the art of repentance. When a child of God comes and we learn how to, to make this a part of our life, we grow deeper and God gives this kind of grace. He extends his grace to us. And repentance is necessary for salvation. We know that. But as we move deeper as a growing, maturing Christian into repentance, we recognize that God's already saved us. But this kind of repentance is not the repentance we experience at salvation. We know that God has saved us. In fact, the writer of Hebrews tells us that if you've already repented that way, you've asked Jesus to forgive your sin, and stop, you know that the essence is of repentance for salvation. It's not that you can't fall away and you need to come back to the Lord, but that there is a repentance that goes deeper. Look what he says. Hebrews 6, verse 1, 2, he says, leave the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. In other words, this very first step toward faith in God that you made was, Jesus, forgive me, and I said, I believe in you. And maybe the tears rolled down, and the freedom and the joy of the Holy Spirit came in in that moment. But we walk away, and after a while, we get to be old, crusty, rusty Christian, you know, and kind of sit on our stuffs and our spiritual lazy chairs with remote controls, flipping through things only we want to hear. And so what do we do? We become complacent against growing in the Lord. We stop excelling in, in the good things of God and stop living the character that he's called us to live because it's work. And if we want to mature and we want to grow and we want to get past some of the immaturities of life, oh, I thank God that I'm past some of the immaturities I had when I was a young man. I can't even tell you some of the stupid things I've done. Probably because you've done them too. Pam could tell you some of the stupid things I've done. 
Let's not let her, shall we? Um, the writer of Hebrews puts it in great perspective. And I like the word, the phrase that he used, let's move on to perfection. And friends, I desire that. Not that I want to say, oh, look at me, I'm perfect. I already am, all right? So, look at me, I'm perfect. I'm glorious. Follow me. Not because of that, but because I want to please the Lord. Because part of that perfection on that list means being humble and serving. The next E, moving on to, or excuse me, the next phrase, next statement is moving on to perfection is learning to apply our faith in Christ to every day and every moment life. We have a responsibility to nurture a passion for freedom. A passion for freedom that's fought oftentimes on battlefields with soldiers the even more heightened passion in our life, the desire to be free from sin, from the ability not to serve God, should be at the forefront and on the tip of every Christ, Christ follower's tongue. And there's so much to be free from in God's word. Moving on to perfection is the practice of living for Jesus in every moment of life. And this creates a, a, a joy in everything we do. There's a lot of things in life I don't necessarily enjoy. I don't like taking out the garbage or cleaning up some mess, or, you know, vacuuming, <laughs> or most forms of work, I guess. <laughs> Actually, if anybody knows me, they would say just the opposite. I probably love doing things too much, and maybe that's my thing. But there's a lot of things I don't enjoy doing. And you know what? We've been taught in the church and in our culture for many years, do what you love. Explore your spiritual gift. Do what passions that you have. Do what you enjoy. And while there's an element of truth to that, it's also lazy to set the responsibilities of the things that we don't enjoy. But you know, the power of God in a maturing Christian moves deeper in repentance and as we do move deeper into, into perfection it causes our attitude to change and shift because how many know that there is a huge difference between doing what you enjoy between doing what enjoying what you doing what you enjoy is just what comes at the top of your head at that moment and you're just gonna do it but enjoying everything you do is different I see people here after some fellowships, oh, what a Christmas party we had, didn't we? That was a riot. I mean, those gifts, that was craziness. I see people cleaning and vacuuming and moving and doing and joy and smile on their faces. It seems so amazing. You see, when we have to do things, we have to do them, and not everything's really a lot of fun. But the child of God, when we begin to understand that, we move to making the everyday things, the everyday life things, things that bring honor to the Lord, and we take joy in that. The next D, I'll show you along, is experience. <clears throat> so sorrow, eager to be free, experience. Repentance brings a, a rich experience to the everyday Christ follower. So we have a lot of experiences in life. You know, if we learn to enjoy pouring our, our hearts more to God and, and seeking Him, life can literally explode with His peace and contentment. You know, it, it is really that focus. It is that focused moment. And for some, repentance is nothing more than temporary sadness because we got caught. Um, but for the Jesus follower, desiring maturity, it is the key to life when we read about it in God's word. His word says every promise is ours. Every promise is ours. So while we're looking at the sin for repentance, if we're, if we're in a, a, an immoral relationship or, or we're having sex outside of marriage or we're in continual drunkenness or um, continual depression or we have all of these things that we dive into and we so enjoy for some reason, they, we have to have them, yet we're, we're missing the bigger point that God says, I have a greater experience for you. There's a lot of experiences in life. Charles Spurgeon said that this gospel does a lot of things, but one thing it always does, it points out our sin. And the reason for that is because repentance brings experience. Repentance produces powerful experiences that God intends for us to benefit from. 2 Timothy 2.24 says that repentance leads to truth. <coughs> Romans 2.4 says that we experience God's kindness 
when we move to repentance. To Isaiah 30 verse 15 says that, uh, it says that repentance brings rest. Um, Luke 24 says that repentance brings forgiveness. And I love this scripture. Acts 3.19. Look at what it says. Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. And that times of refreshing. You see, this is the nitty-gritty of getting in at the altar. This is the nitty-gritty of saying, God have mercy, and the weeping and the crying, and actually the Bible talks about the out loud cry out to God prayer, which we don't have anymore in church. We're, we're too civilized for that, right? So he t it talks about crying out to God and laying your heart open and saying, God, have mercy on me. Friend, i got to tell you that this is the call of God and His Holy Spirit according to His Word that He has in mind for every person. You are not excluded from this. And he says that when you do that, when you walk through it, how many times have I experienced this, friends? This is the experience of God, that when I go through that gut-wrenching, heart-pounding, carpet-sucking prayer time, that I begin, and when I get up, I begin to realize and, and experience the joy and the peace of the Holy Spirit. That that is a very real and genuine thing that's missing in our church culture. We're so liturgical and dry. We dare preachers to say anything to us that will shake us in our boots because we just like to pick apart what they say because we know better. After all, we're, we're a young buck from Bible college. Times of refreshing from the Lord. I mean, I've worked on jobs, sweaty all day, hot, framing maybe in this hot sun, rolling trusses on a roof or something, and Man, it's hard work. And then when break time comes and I pick up my gallon of water, woo! I don't care if it's cold at that point or not, it's wet. And I'm drinking it and I'm chugging it and it's like, oh. Actually, it's a little opposite at my age now. It's running to the bathroom and, <laughs> oh. That's relief. <laughs> Pam's going, don't say that out loud! <laughs> Times of refreshing. You know what it's like to be weary. You know what it's like to be tired. And what does the Lord do? He gives you times of refreshing. But it goes through repentance. It goes through repentance. But you and I cannot experience that awesomeness of God without it. We don't, I think the reason that we don't maybe experience this is because we don't really realize and we're not taking seriously the fact that God's calling us to live this way. A life of worship. A life of devotion to Him. A life that brings honor to Him. There can never be an experience if there is no doing. And there is a difference between simply trying and actually doing. I've been skiing, and I will tell you it was a great experience that I've had. And, uh, I have held my boys, though, when they've been in, when they've been in the hospital or with the midwife and helped to deliver them. And I'll tell you, that's an experience. I've snorkeled with some pretty big fish, and that was fun, and scuba dive, but I've made a commitment for marriage, and every married person here will tell you that experience comes with its trials, and it comes with its joys, but there's no real experience without doing. You see, trying and doing are very different. Repentance isn't something we try and hope it'll work out. We think Jesus is something that we try in our culture. I'm going to, and we offer that in our churches, just try Jesus, just try him. You can't just try Jesus. You do. You become in relationship with, and you live for, and you love, and you, you begin to recognize His great grace. Repentance isn't something we try and hope works out. We, we don't try skydiving. We just, you know, we don't just try Him. And finally, keep repentance in focus with the K. I'm sure there may be some in the room who made a New Year's resolution. And you said, well, I'm going to lose so much weight, or I'm going to go running for 20 miles every day. Um, I'm, going to, <laughs> I'm going to finish college four years in a month, you know. <laughs> Repentance is like, though, changing your lifestyle. 
introducing new eating habits and, and conditioning, going against the flow, you know, going and sailing into the wind. And when, when you go and you make a New Year's resolution, you say, I'm going to eat differently, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And, and so, you know, sin starts off slow, though. It starts off, and this is from personal experience, with chocolate, and it ends with chocolate. It starts slow with the candy bar, but then it moves to pizza and chocolate, mashed potatoes, chocolate, pile of gravy, extra butter on everything, and chocolate. And the body starts life-threatening indications like, you know, high blood sugar, hypertension. I've never had either of those. And, and a heart attack, which could almost kill you. I've been alive now more than a year past my heart attack, praise God, for a fit man like myself. <laughs> Repentance, though, doesn't do things so sloppily, does it? It lives life with repentance and keeps on repenting. A maturing Christian knows the art of repentance and is unashamed to cry over his sin or her sin. That we return to the place of the altar. Repentance means acknowledging our foolishness, turning to Jesus for help, and leaning into God's grace. Whatever it takes, a new diet. And it's only then can we walk in the truth that he has. So how can we keep our repentance in focus? Three things here, maybe obvious, but number one is humility and prayer. Recognize that God has given grace to you. He is perfect. We're not. And humility means saying, God, you are bigger than me. I will listen to you. I will respect others. I will do what you've called me to do. I will be humble. You see, tears are a big sign of that. It's kind of hard for guys. We don't like to cry. God says, when you really repent, I might turn on the waterworks a little bit. The second thing is being diligent in his, in his word. Rehearse the commands that God has put in his word. The character qualities that he puts in scripture. These 49, if you want to join us at the 915 hour. It was a, it was a powerhouse this morning, wasn't it, everybody? It's going to be, it's, you're going to be blown away as we talk about each one of these in detail. You know what I'm miss. Write the, down the freedom and the power that God has as a result of these principles. What's in his word that you're failing at? Let that lead you to repentance. And you know what? The Bible tells us that God will give the answer. And then finally, practice the principle. Once we have the character quality in mind that combats our shortcoming, we begin to put it into practice. And it comes then from the inside out. It comes from not always maybe wanting to, but a desire to please the Lord that begins to transform our thinking. And every day it begins with humility, in prayer, diligence in the word, practicing the presence of God. And um, how do we do this? The psalmist says, his mercies are new every morning. And the first step, as we learned this morning, was if you're going to be perfect in all these character qualities, forget about it. That it requires one thing that maybe we need to learn and learn brand new. And that is crying out to God. You see, a cry is different than prayer. Prayer, effective praying, has to be learned. Jesus said so, and he put it into principle. But crying out to God is different. It takes no rehearsal. God hears it. When we say, God, I recognize your standard, and I, I simply want to bring you honor. So today, in the beginning of our mission month, is very much about the missionary, which is you and me. The sign as you drive out the parking lot today says, you are now entering the mission field. But if the missionary isn't ready for the mission field, he or she is going to be tremendously ineffective. And friends, God has great success for you and I in mind in terms of all of this. He's calling us to repent and draw closer to him and make it a habit of our life that repentance is not just for the one-time experience coming to Jesus initially, which is so beautiful and important. It's so incredibly important, but that for the maturing Christian, it is for someone to say, yeah, I want to take on those challenges. I want to look inside my life. I want to let the Holy Spirit do his work in me, and I want to let God's word chisel me up. Yeah, he chisels good stuff, right? Chisel. Praise God. Let's pray about it, shall we? 
Let's stand together. Our worship team's going to come. We're just going to sing the chorus to that song. More than amazing. More than amazing. But let's pray first. Jesus, so grateful for this group that's here today and so thankful, entirely, incredibly thankful for your word. I praise you for the time that we've had here today to talk about repentance and to be able to talk about seeking you. So Lord, we ask that, Lord, there would be an opportunity, Lord, even in these next few moments as we're gathered here, for us to be able to clearly tell you what's going on in our heart. Friend, really, that's really the key of where it's at. If you're here this morning and, and you've been challenged in some way by any of the scriptures or some of the words spoken, I want to encourage you that it's about taking that step toward Jesus and saying, God, as a son or daughter of God, I just, I just want to know you better, Jesus. Let him take the burden of your sin away. Let him take the burden of, of the things that you're failing at and carry it on his shoulders. He knows you're still going to mess up. He knows you're still going to be imperfect. But he also knows that you're now looking to him for grace in those moments. Are you going to turn to him? Will you turn to him in this thing called repentance? I want to ask in two categories. Number one, with your heads bowed, if you've come today and you recognize it, yeah, pastor, I need to repent and come to Christ as Savior. It's one of the most, it's the most beautiful thing you'll ever experience in this life, friend. If you've never said, Jesus, fill me with your spirit, forgive me, come in, let him do that this morning. I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you, but if that's you and you say, that's really compelling to me, I want to do that. Would you simply lift your hand up and down so we can see it? Yes, yes, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, someone else.